working with Lisa and sure. then just going down the table? Um, yeah. Do you need us to come up or can y'all you know, hear me? Oh, uh, there are microphones placed on the middle of each table. Yeah, just yeah. voice yourself towards the microphone and perfect. Okay. Hi, I'm Lisa Alexander. I'm a lead AP, which stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, accredited professional from the United States Green Building Council, which basically means I'm a specialist in green building and sustainability. Um, I also primarily do work for nonprofits. I do research and education for colleges and corporations. Uh, I'm an independent consultant. I am on, on no one's payroll, so I am here as biased as I can be. Good morning. My name is Sherry Truseski. I am with the Institute for Public Policy and Economic Development, uh, which is a nonprofit run by Wilkes University. We are a research organization, and we have conducted a lot of social and societal impact research on Marcella Shell. Good morning. Uh, my name is Carl Held. And I'll, I have a disclaimer that I am not an expert in the fracking field. I'm a retired Allentown police officer and retired from the United States military. And I'm also a student here at the college and I was asked to be part of the panel to give a student perspective to the fracking process. I'm Tom Shepstone. I'm the uh, campaign director for the Energy in Depth Northeast Marcellus Initiative. We're an industry sponsored organization that promotes natural gas development in northeastern Pennsylvania and the southern tier of New York. I'm also a landowner and have a private consulting business in the planning and research field. Hi, so I'm Ken Klimo. I'm a professor of biology and environmental science at Wilkes University. And so uh, I'm a, a plant ecologist uh, and, and botanist where I teach courses in biology and botany and, and ecology plus alternative energy. Um, I also run the um, Institute for Energy and Environmental Research at Wilkes. Um, and then I also do research on the environmental impacts of energy development, uh, especially in northeastern Pennsylvania. Hi, I'm Dr. Dave DeLauro. I'm uh, one of the chemistry professors at Northampton Community College. I teach organic chemistry here. I've been at the college for nine years, uh, and my degrees are from Lehigh, from organic chemistry, and in biochemistry. And I'm Karen Faraden. I'm the founder of an organization called Burke's Gas Truth. Um, I'm in Kutztown, Pennsylvania, but I do a lot of work here in the Lehigh Valley as well. Our organization is opposed to natural gas drilling in Pennsylvania and everywhere else. So I'm an activist. <laughs> Here and what is the Marcellus Shale and how much natural gas does it contain? All right, thank you very much. So I guess I get to bat lead off here. Actually, before I answer the question, uh, let me just ask the audience here a quick question. How many of you use natural gas in your homes? Raise your hand really high if you use natural gas. All right, so it looks like about a third of you, maybe half of you use natural gas. All right. So anyway, so um, uh, I'm asked to ta uh, address the question, what is hydraulic fracturing? So hydraulic fracturing is a process by which uh, energy companies um, who are interested in liberating natural gas from deep rock formations uh, will take um, a drill and basically drill down as far as the, uh, the, the, the rock layer, in this case the Marcellus layer is, which might be about a mile deep or so, um, they, they will drill down and then they actually uh, turn the drill horizontally, so actually cutting through uh, the horizontally bedded rock plane. Uh, then what they'll do is they'll, um, uh, as they go through, they actually make explosions, so they, they break up the rock to fracture the rock and then they'll force water that contains other compounds down into the uh, well uh, to, to further break up the rock and liberate the methane, which is trapped within little bubbles in the rock and then after the water is withdrawn, then the uh, methane will flow back up again, and then it's captured, and it's sent uh, after processing to your homes to heat your food and, and warm your water and do whatever you want to do with it. Uh, Marcellus Shale uh, is, again, this rock formation which covers, I think it's about uh, two-thirds of the state, um, most of the northern part, and then the western part is covered as well. I don't think we're, co we're in Marcellus Shale here uh, in Bethlehem. Um, certain, some areas of Marcellus Shale not really uh, have marketable shale, but I guess that'll be a later question. Um, and so the, the question then about how much natural gas is located within, uh, really, boy, that depends upon who you ask. And, and so uh, right now the, the estimates really range anywhere from 50 to 500 um, trillion cubic feet of natural gas. 
um, although some of that is not really usable. So right now, I think what the, the, main, the, the primary estimate is about 140 trillion cubic feet of natural gas is under our feet. Gas and why natural gas is termed clean burning? Okay, uh, in the United States, 24% of all the used energy is contributed to natural gas. 22% of that total is used in the residential applications, such as cooking, uh, clothes dryers, pool heaters, uh, outdoor lighting, etc., barbecues. 14% is used in the commercial and, and industry, uh, 32% industrial and 14% commercial. They use it in commercial cooling and heating units. Uh, it's the number one source of fuel for cooking in the, in the food and restaurant industry. And they also use reciprocating engines and turbines for production of electricity. And one of the other things that, that they use uh, natural gas for is the fact that they extract from the natural gas uh, ethane, propane, and butane, which are used in other applications, both in, uh, in home use and industrial use. Uh, only about 8% or f is used in the transportation sector. Uh, in the United States, as of 2010, there were approximately 150,000 NGVs, natural gas vehicles, and more than 5 million worldwide. A lot of these NGVs are in your taxi cab fleets and also uh, commercial bus fleets. They haven't really gone too far in advancement of the natural gas vehicle because of the fact that the initial costs for the production are very high and there's no infrastructure set up right now for refueling of those natural gas vehicles. And about 14% is used every year for the generation of electricity where they're turning over from coal-fired plants to nuclear and gas-fired plants. As, as for it being a clean burning fuel, because of the fact that it's in a gaseous state already, once it's burned, it's not leaving a big carbon footprint because the, the molecular structure is consumed once that heat is generated. And that's why they classify it as the uh, a cleaner burning fuel. Karen, and it is extractable. Well, if the two good questions, the answer to the first one depends on who you ask. Uh, if you listen to the industry, the industry will say that there are 100 years worth of natural gas in the shale. Uh, President Obama said the same thing in the State of the Union address. But if you listen to the Energy Information Department or the U.S. Geological Survey, who's already referred to earlier as that they determine things in terms of how much gas is in the shale, Energy and Information Department talks about it in terms of years of gas available, the, the estimate is much lower. Uh, Energy Information Department recently came out with an estimate of about six years of natural gas. I've heard estimates as high as 11 years, but it's nothing close to 100. So why? Why this discrepancy? And the answer to that is in the answer to the second question, actually, which is the uh, idea of natural gas, 10% uh, of it being extractable. Uh, generally speaking, 10 to 15% of natural gas is considered to be a sure thing in any kind of shale formation, because they know that they have the technology and they know that it's commercially viable to go after it. Um, beyond that, the availability of the gas is sort of ranked in terms of probability, from probable to possible to speculative. And so when you hear the 100-year estimates, it's generally taking into consideration all of that gas, which may actually not be commercially viable or technologically possible to get to. The more conservative estimates have to do with more of the short bet. Uh, Carl, the materials and chemicals are used to extract the gas. Okay, the, the fracking process was first started in the 1940s, and uh, the Mitchell Energy Company, used this process in the Barnett shale fields in Texas. And they had a lot of problems with it because they, they couldn't get the fissures that they produced in the, in the shale and the rock formations to stay open long enough to have the natural gas extracted through and get it into the boreholes. So over the years what they did was they, they redeveloped the process and included sand inside the water which was pumped through in high pressure. And that did it a little bit better, but
but they found that by adding certain chemicals into the process, it created bigger fissures and allowed them to form pores where the fissures were, were kept open and let the gas flow more freely. Now one of the bigger concerns was the fact that if they didn't put any type of casings inside the boreholes, any of the water that was pushed in under high pressure would seep out into the ground. So what they've developed is a system of casings where they put a cement casing into the borehole and then encapsulate that with a steel casing surrounded by a special mud mixture, just like you saw in the uh, deep well explosion down in the Gulf of Mexico. Once that has occurred, then they drill another section and complete that process so that all of the all of the chemicals and water and sand that are forced in and then brought back to the surface as wastewater don't uh, spill out into the soil. Now, is it is it 100% foolproof? That I can't answer because I'm not, I'm not in the in the gas producing industry, but it has been used for a while. Unfortunately, there's a list of about oh uh, maybe 25 or 30 different chemicals that are used in the process. Uh, the, the most prolific one is hydrochloric acid, which they use to, to break down the rock and shale formations. And they have methanol, ethyl glycol, and, and a lot of other uh, chemicals. Some of them, unfortunately, which are on the car, uh, carcinogen list that was put out by the EPA. So the basic mixture is mostly hydrochloric acid, and uh, they also use... Uh, I believe it's called uh, ammonium chloride, which is a biocide which kills the bacteria that is formed, along with sand and water forced in under high pressure. Should it respond to gas well development? We conducted a survey in 2010. Uh, we, it was selected counties in Pennsylvania and New York, and the goal of the survey was to gauge folks' perception of natural gas development in, in their area. And what we had found was a lot of people didn't have a good deal of information about it. They had spoke to friends and neighbors about it, and what they knew they had learned from the media. Uh, they didn't really think it was going to impact them too significantly. They didn't think their quality of life was going to decrease. They expected jobs to come to the area and, and good things happening with the economy. Uh, they didn't really see uh, huge changes happening at the time, and they didn't expect huge things to happen. Um, what we did find when we, when we dove into some of the survey data was that certain groups favored or didn't favor the drilling. Men favored it more than women. Uh, elderly people favored it more than young people. And the more educated were not as much in favor of it as those uh, with, with lower levels of education. Uh, we found some interesting things there, too. Evidence. Do companies set aside land to be used for drilling? And if so, how much is anticipated to be used? Well, first of all, uh, they do not set aside land for drilling. What has happened is the companies don't own the land. They lease the land. So, uh, and what they do is they develop that gradually, uh, develop their leased resources, and uh, over time, it's not clear how much of that will be used or how much won't. A lot of it depends upon regulations. For example, Chesapeake has 200,000 acres leased in New York State. However, uh, New York State has not finished its regulations yet, so it's unclear how much of that is actually going to be uh, developed. Uh, companies do lease much more than they intend on developing. Uh, as to uh, local employment, uh, that is increasing every single day. Of course, when things start out, you have to re request expertise from people who have it. And so a lot of initial employees are from Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, places like that. Uh, but when we visited uh, a couple of months ago a drilling rig in Lycoming County area, or Sullivan County, New York, or Pennsylvania, excuse me, uh, we were instructed that the, because uh, I asked the question, that 75% of their day crew was Pennsylvanians and 100% of their night crew was Pennsylvanians. We also know from statistics that how it's not properly operated and will those risks lead to long term financial problems? Thank you. Um, Tom just made a good economic case for why drilling is a good thing, but there are huge environmental impacts that need to be taken in con into consideration. Uh, among the biggest concerns, and I could spend this entire session just listing the concerns, but among the biggest are the consumptive use of water. 
If you don't understand what that means, I think about water that makes it through the water cycle. You use water, it ends up becoming a raindrop. At some point, it comes down and replenishes our rivers. That's not what's happening with the water that's being extracted for use in Marcellus Shale drilling. It's being removed from the water supply permanently because the water that comes out the other end of this process is so dirty, you can't use it again. Now, the Susquehanna River Basin Commission just two weeks ago today approved permits that will total in one year's time the extraction of 44 billion gallons of water from that one river alone. Just one river. And fracking is going on all over the country. It's taking place all around the world. We're just talking about one river, 44 billion gallons of water that's pretty much not coming back. That's terrifying when you consider that wars are already being fought on this planet over water. We can't afford to squander our natural resources over natural gas, which we actually can live without. So that's the major concern for me. That's what got me into it. But there are many others. Uh, the contaminated water that comes out the other end of the process, what do you do with it? We haven't found reasonable ways of dealing with all of that. There's also something called methane migration, where the fracturing of the shale allows some of the methane and some of the other things that have been safely encapsulated in the shale for all these years to come up to the surface and, and, and contaminate groundwater. I mean, they're finding not only methane, but radioactive substances in people's well water. Um, that's a huge concern, and how do you stem that? We don't know, because there are any number of means for the methane to make it to the surface. It just doesn't make it into the water, it makes it into the air. There are various steps along the way of this process where methane can actually make it into the air, and methane is a greenhouse gas. And in fact, it's a more efficient greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So at a time when we're talking about climate change and we're very concerned about you know, our sustainability as a planet, this is not the time to be putting an even more efficient greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. Those are some of the big ones. But another one, the, uh, the name Halliburton already came up. Uh, Halliburton, uh, there's something called the Halliburton loophole that was written into the 2005 energy bill as a manufacturer of natural gas. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the fracking fluids that they use in the natural gas drilling process. Uh, we don't know what's in that, that, that the, the, uh, the Halliburton loophole excludes the manufacturers of fracking fluid from having to disclose the contents. You can't regulate what you don't know. Tom, how does the oil and to ensure that hydraulic fracturing is done, fracturing is done responsibly? Well, first of all, we make sure people do know. And if you go to frackfocus.org, I would encourage you to write that down, F-R-A-C, focus.org, you will find the ingredients in fracturing fluids revealed for all wells in Pennsylvania with cooperating companies, and that's all the major companies that are doing business in Pennsylvania. It's all there. It's all available for anybody to see. It's always been available on the DEP website as well. There's nothing being hidden, and in fact, no less an authority than Dr. Tony and Graffi, who I'll be on a panel with this evening in Bloomsburg, has said there's no such thing as a Halliburton loophole. That is a, an urban myth, if you will. And uh, I would point out that uh, the companies are doing a fantastic job, I think, of getting more of the information out. We work overtime on that, trying to get out the facts. We do a lot of, on our site, eidmarcellus.org, we try to get out a lot of facts about the industry. We disclose the fluids, we disclose the processes, we do a lot of educational work on methane migration, which, by the way, is common throughout Pennsylvania, and particularly in northeastern Pennsylvania. That is a common, existing problem caused equally by water wells as well as gas wells and virtually anything else that you do in the ground. Uh, it is also a problem which has been identified many times by people who are doing gas drilling because what happens is the companies do a terrific job of baseline water testing. They test out as far as 4,000 feet now doing baseline water testing and frequently they identify severe water quality problems in Pennsylvania, bring them to the attention of the homeowner and help them correct the problem before there's any drilling in the area. It happens all the time. Uh, and I think that's a critical fact that we are, we are discovering problems. We are helping to illuminate problems. We are helping to solve problems. Okay. And, and Tom, again, uh, how much water is used in an individual well? Um, how much does it cost to operate a well? And which PA, Pennsylvania counties have the most wells and about how many? Okay, lots of questions there. <laughs> I got to put my glasses on for that one to look at my notes here. First of all, it's about 4 million gallons on average, and that sounds like a lot of water, doesn't it? Uh, and, and when uh, Karen listed that big number, uh, it is a big number until you put it in context and realize it's only a couple of seconds of flow in the Susquehanna River. 
Uh, when you add it all up, it amounts to a trivial amount. As a matter of fact, there's less gas, as the SRBC itself has said, there's a lot less gas used in drilling a well, a gas wells than there is in, in irrigating golf courses. Think about that. There's a golf course around the corner. I drove by it coming in here. That golf course is a much bigger user of water. Now, the first objection we're going to hear is, well, that's not a consumptive use. Well, ultimately, neither is, is the gas drilling, because when you burn, when you combust uh, natural gas, which is, which is methane, one of the things that you get is water, which goes back into the atmosphere. That's not a fact that's commonly known by a lot of people. So it ultimately is not a consumptive uh, use. The, I would also point out that it costs about 4 to $5 million per well. The cost comes down sometimes in terms of technological improvements, but then sometimes it goes up because of regulatory impositions. But it's about $4 million to $5 million a well. There's about 150 different occupations involved in any given well uh, being developed. And there's about 400 workers per well from beginning to end. So it's a, it's a rather huge amount. Most of the wells have been drilled in the northern tier where we cover. Bradford County, 907 wells. Tioga, 648. Lycoming, 425. And Susquehanna, 368. Those are the major counties. And they're seeing tremendous economic gains as a result of that. Bradford and Susquehanna gained 3,600 jobs over the last couple of years alone. Well, unlike some of my counterparts, I hope to stay within my two minutes. And thanks to Karen, I will be able to, because she already described some things I'd like to discuss. Um, the EPA has really nothing to do with this. As Karen had mentioned, there was a bill which I read, and the Halliburton loophole does exist. Uh, I do encourage you to read the bills. I do encourage you to read the bill in Harrisburg right now, the House Bill 1950, because if you read it, you'll basically see that we are giving the gas industries full reign with little to no regulations. I've also read the IPCC report, another report I encourage you all to read, the International Panel on Climate Change. It's 715 pages long, but it is worth every read. Um, the EPA has nothing to do with this thanks to the bill that's signed by Bush in 2005 that does have a Halliburton loophole, which basically states that the gas and oil industry is exempt from the Clean Air and Water Act. Clean Air and Water Act was very important in the 70s. A lot of you are probably too young to remember, but our water was severely polluted. The streams up in coal mining region, up in the Scranton area where I live now, used to run orange uh, when, the, when the mines were banned and the, the streams literally ran orange. And this is now happening out in Wyoming. Yes, there might be a boom, but um, as the gas and oil industries leave, they leave behind a ghost town and they leave behind a mess. Um, so the EPA has nothing to do with this. It is brought down to the state level and to the local municipalities. So in, with us, that would be the DEP, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. They are overtaxed, overworked, and underfunded. Much of their funding in recent times has been pulled away, and a lot of that has been given to the gas and oil industries. So even with their underfunding and their loss of people and everything else, between 2008 and 2010, there were almost 1,700 known violations of spills, leaks, contamination, soil, air, water pollution, et cetera, et cetera. And those are just the ones they caught. That doesn't even begin to mention the ones they didn't catch. For instance, in uh, Tunkhannock, um, there's an activist up there I know, amazing woman. She's in her 70s. You would never know she's in her 70s. She's bright, spry, um, very much involved. She hires some college students to follow one of the fracking trucks because she kept going to her local meetings put, put on by the gas industry. She kept asking, where's all this fracking fluid going? It's highly toxic and corrosive. There have been fish kills in the Susquehanna. There have been fish kills in other rivers and streams up there. Um, and what she found when she paid these college students to follow one of these fracking trucks with, full of flacking, fracking fluid that was supposed to go someplace to be treated, it was winter time, and on Highway 84, they opened a little valve on the truck, they drove down 84, and it all leaked down on the road. So the, the EPA has nothing to do with this, it's the DEP, and right now they're underfunded. Um, there's not, they can only do so much. County, where there are 560 gas wells, um, the DEP and EPA require that chloramine, rather than chlorine, be used to treat the water. Can you explain the difference between chloramine and chlorine? Thank you. Uh, as an organic chemist, I can't help but at least show you the structures of these. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, chlorine, this is used to treat drinking water, and then the chloramine, the difference is it's a derivative of ammonia, and they just put a chlorine attached to it. So both of these can be used to treat drinking water. Uh, both have their pros and cons when used to treat drinking water. 
chlorine is more likely to attach to hydrocarbons uh, and hydro, uh, chlorinated hydrocarbons uh, are carcinogenic. And chloroform is the, the, the uh, hydrocarbon that they were finding. So instead of using chlorine, they decided to use uh, chloramine. It is less likely to attach halogens to hydrocarbons, so less carcinogens in the water that you drink. Uh, also another bonus of the chloramine is that if you have heavily chlorinated water, it tends to have a little bit of an odor or a taste to it that people kind of find uh, not pleasant. You don't have that with the chloramine. So those are two potential bonuses of it. Uh, two potential bad parts of the chloramine uh, are that even though it presents or prevents the carcinogens from being in the water, it does make other compounds more soluble in the water, such as lead and other heavy metals. So you don't have the halogenated hydrocarbons that cause cancer, but now you have potentially a higher percentage of uh, heavy metals in the water when you use the chloramine. Uh, another uh, disadvantage of the chloramine is both the chlorine and the chloramine are used to get rid of microorganisms such as E. coli that could be in the water. Chlorine is more effective at getting rid of things such as E. coli as opposed to the chloramine. So both have some pros uh, and some cons, but the reason they're using the chloramine is because uh, the EPA, uh, at least currently, is much more concerned about halogenated hydrocarbons because they're shown to be carcinogenic. So they're using the chloramine to prevent more chloroform from being produced. I have to mention quickly about frac focus. Um, frac focus allows the uh, manufacturers of fracking fluid and the drillers to list things that, as uh, as long as they're not the proprietary, they're still in other words, they're allowed to still protect their proprietary recipes for fracking fluid. So it's really not full disclosure. But uh, as on to the next question, uh, one of the things that came up as well is this idea of baseline testing of water. There's no baseline testing of water required anywhere in the United States. So there's one way that you stop by just managing the process better. Uh, if, we, if we started out knowing what we're doing to the water, we might be able to manage it better. The construction of wells could be done a lot better. Uh, there are endless problems with some of the permit violations that Lisa talked about with uh, uh, the, the well casings not being allowed to dry. That's one of the channels for methane to get out into the groundwater. So there are ways that the, the, the process isn't really being managed all that carefully. But then think about the fact that the wells aren't going anywhere. So over time, you know, we can manage them now while we're paying attention to them, but years hence, we're not going to be drilling anymore. What's going to happen to those wells? Well, if wells are anything like the rest of us, they will decay. Then what? Nobody's going to be paying attention. Nobody will be minding the store. And uh, I didn't get to the economic issue in the last round of questions, but just to cap one well costs $100,000. We've got 5,000 wells in Pennsylvania now. How are we going to pay to cap all of those wells? And there are 160,000 wells already existing in Pennsylvania that are considered orphan and abandoned wells back from the days when farmers would drill a hole in their backyard. And so there are lots and lots of channels for methane to make it into the atmosphere, to make it into the groundwater, and we won't have the money, we don't have it now, to, to take care of that problem. And what kinds of risks they pose? Okay, these are all very interesting chemicals. Uh, let's, let's start with the radium. Uh, Actually, back, back in the uh, early 1900s, uh, about 1917 to 1920, uh, radium or uh, radon was used quite a bit. Radium was used quite a bit as uh, a base in paints because it's radioactive, it decays, and it actually glows. So they would use this uh, to paint onto watches so that the watches would glow in the dark. Uh, this was kind of before they realized that um, it's potentially dangerous. So they're actually kind of a famous group of women called the, the Radium Girls. Uh, and these were young women uh, back right at, uh, during World War I that were employed by a company to uh, paint these watches with this radium-laced paint so that it would glow in the dark. And they thought it was really neat because this was this paint that would glow, so they would paint their fingernails with it, they'd actually put it on their teeth, paint their faces, uh, and they all got very sick because radium uh, causes uh, various types of cancers, sores, open wounds, uh, genetic diseases. So many of the women later on then sued the company, and this caused a lot, a lot of new laws to be formed to uh, prevent the use of radium so much. Uh, what radium does is if it gets on your body or in your skin, it tricks your body, and your body actually thinks that it's calcium, and it treats it like calcium, and it incorporates it into your bones. And then once the radium is in your bones, it begins to decay, and then causes uh, uh, mutations in the bones, which could, which could cause bone cancer. So that's the, the radium problem. Uh, the other one would be uh, the heavy metals. Uh, some heavy metals are absolutely necessary for life. They're the trace elements in our body, like iron, 
copper and zinc, but uh, some of the more dangerous heavy metals that could be found like arsenic, cadmium, lead, uh, and mercury, what happens is if they are absorbed into your body and not properly metabolized, they build up on the soft tissues in your body, such as uh, your liver, your kidneys, your lungs, and at least for me, most interestingly, uh, the brain. Uh, some symptoms of heavy metal poisoning are joint pain, vision problems, and mental confusion. Uh, you can actually go insane from heavy metal poisoning. If you remember Alice in Wonderland, the story, one of the characters in it was the Mad Hatter. That was actually taken from, from history. Back in the early 1800s, a very common profession in England was to be a hatter. They would make a hat, and then to finish the top hat off, they dipped their hands in mercury and coat the hat with the mercury to make the hat look nice and shiny. And they couldn't figure out why all these hatters were going crazy. So the Mad Hatter actually comes from uh, history where people in England who used to make hats would go crazy. So heavy metal poisoning, what it can do is cause uh, dementia and problems in the mind. Hey Dave, yes. as an organic chemist, can you lump the last four together uh, in the interest of time? All right. Uh, the last four uh, are all derivatives of benzene, which is another question I'm going to talk about later, but all four of them are carcinogens. So you don't want to have any of them in your body because they will metabolize into benzene, which is a very well-known carcinogen. All of these. So first of all, there's extensive safety procedures at sites and security procedures. You can't get on a site unless you go through security. There's also requirements for uh, wearing all kinds of uh, protective equipment, steel toes, goggles, hard hats, all those kinds of things. Uh, but more, more important thing to me is you can't really work at a site unless you attend a safety meeting every morning. And if you miss the safety meeting, you, you don't get paid for that day. Um, also, if you, if you fail to comply with procedures, uh, you can be terminated. I would point out, though, that the main protection here is the DEP enforcement. And contrary to what some of the others have said here, the DEP enforcement is very good. Uh, and if you look at John Hanger's record, if you go to his blog, uh, uh, you'll find he was the former DEP secretary under the Rendell administration. Uh, he believes that the DEP's record is very, very good. And he believes that the number of violations, I believe there was something like thir uh, over four years, something like 3,000, a little bit more than that, violations. Uh, he believes it's an excellent record because it indicates that we're, the DEP is on top of enforcing this stuff. And I would point out, in addition to that, we have over 4,000 wells. The number of violations is less than the three-quarters of a violation per well. Now, you can't build a house without a violation. You can't do it. You cannot do it. And yet, we're able to drill a well without a violation. And it indicates that we're able to do this stuff. And secondly, in terms of the safety of the water and things of that nature, we, you know, we hear all these chemicals and everybody gets excited. Well, keep in mind here for a second that, first of all, benzene is something you folks use every single day. You're exposed to it, and you're exposed to a lot of it when you fill your car with gas. That's what it is, benzene. And you take that risk because you know it's a manageable risk. I would also point out that we don't drink flat, frac fluid. We don't drink flowback water. We don't drink produced water. And all that stuff is recycled. Virtually every company now is recycling uh, either 100% or very near 100% of their uh, fluids that are coming back. Uh, that's the reality, folks. We don't drink that stuff. We use it for processes, just like we use the stuff under our kitchen sink for processes, just like we use gasoline to power our car. It's how you do it, the safety procedures you apply, and the way you assess the risk. And I think it's done well in the gas industry. Which is a research and advocacy organization found that benzene levels in fracking fluid were up to 93 times higher than those found in diesel. Please explain the carcinogenic effects of benzene. Uh, benzene, another very interesting chemical molecule that we work with in my organic chemistry class, if you want to register for organic chemistry 201 or organic chemistry 201. This is benzene here. We work with it quite a bit. Uh, the carcinogenic effects of benzene is when it's uh, if it is taken into the body, it metabolizes uh, initially in the liver, and what happens is that ring of carbons breaks open, and when it breaks open, it becomes very sticky. And uh, think of this sticky. And what it does is it will form covalent bonds to other macromolecules in your body and allow proper metabolism to form uh, to continue. Uh, another major problem that benzene can have in the body uh, when it metabolizes is it is something called a very good oxidizer which means it will actually go in and uh, cause oxidation reactions to occur, which damages your DNA, which causes things such as uh, cancer, bone marrow failure, anemia, leukemia, and suppresses your immune system. Uh, as mentioned earlier, benzene is found naturally in many things. It's found when you burn wood. That, 
benzene. Uh, when you smoke a cigarette, uh, what you exhale is benzene. Gasoline, uh, paint, uh, glue, detergents have benzene in it. And one kind of interesting thing is any person throughout your life is going to be exposed to a certain level of benzene. And approximately 50% of the average person's exposure to benzene throughout their lifetime, 50%, is due to either cigarettes that they actually smoke or secondhand smoke. So a major a way that people get benzene in their body is through cigarette smoke. Sherry in the targeted regions. Okay, we did a study at the end of 2011 that looked at the housing impacts in 12 counties in Pennsylvania as a result of Marcellus Shale development. And the, the biggest impact we found was in the rental market. What is happening is there is an influx of gas workers from out of state. They need a place to live. Many of them are interested in, in staying in hotels, but many of them want to rent. So folks who have lived in the area maybe their entire lives uh, are sort of being forced out of their homes to an extent. When their lease is up, their landlord has the opportunity to take advantage of market conditions that lets them double and sometimes triple the rent, which essentially forces the, the current resident out and lets them take gas workers in as tenants. Uh, so this, this has caused a a lot of issues. It's, it's causing an out migration in some of the counties that have had, that are experiencing a lot of activity into counties like Lackawanna and Luzerne uh, from, from the northern tier. So really the, uh, the, the rental market has been affected the most. Even social services have been affected uh, with some of these people not being able to find homes. Uh, one social service uh, county agency uh, purchased tents for folks to stay in because they didn't have a place to live. Uh, we know of children being taken away from their parents because they were living in substandard conditions because there is just no housing available in these areas. Lisa, how is she's in Pennsylvania that would be affected by this activity? Well, unfortunately, there's no um, real funding or, or work going into uh, looking into the endangered species of the area and how it usually takes years. If you look, we're still finding you know remnants of the Exxon Valdez, which now we're being able to apply to what happened in the Gulf. The dolphins are showing up with all kinds of um, the metals in their bodies and what happened there. So it'll be years before we can really see that. But I will give you a personal story because I do tend to think that um, testimonials from real people who deal with this uh, see the issues. And I have been throughout our state and the West interviewing people. And I can just tell you from personally, my I have cousins grew up here in Nazareth. I grew up in Nazareth. They have a hunting cabin in Bradford County. They've had it there for generations. It's on 40 acres and it abuts state game lands. Uh, Bradford County is under, the entire county is under a gas lease. There's not an inch of property there that is not. Um, they no longer go to their cabin. They haven't been there in two years. They can't hunt there because there's so much activity. 200, get 200 trucks a day into a fracking rig um, to, to deliver fresh water. There's between the air pollution, the noise pollution, the light pollution, when a rig goes up, it's 24-7, nonstop, trucks c coming in and out, light, noise, air pollution, it's all there. It disrupts the uh, natural habits of the wildlife. It disrupts their migration paths. We've got waste pools of water sitting there. We've got the pad sites. We've got pipelines. So that's disrupting how they move. It's disrupting the reproductive cycles, etc. Not that global warming as a whole isn't also doing that. But they have no deer to hunt there anymore. They now come up to my 53 acres in Pike County, which we are not really sitting on a desirable part of, Mar of the Marcellus Shale. So there's no drilling going on there. And that's where they come to hunt and get the deer. So it is affected. It's already affecting the wildlife without any studies and surveys, just by going and seeing and, and experiencing it. Well, you can send them to Easton to my yard to hunt the deer. <laughs> Pennsylvania residents due to development of these wells. Sure. Uh, we have studied uh, career paths that, that someone might be able to take in the natural gas industry with, with uh, really just a, a little bit of training. They can start as an extraction helper. Uh, they can go up to a roughneck, a derrick operator, a, a rig operator, a pump system operator. There's really a lot of movement for folks uh, who are interested in working into, in this industry. Uh, what we have studied the most are really the, the secondary effects of, 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 on jobs. The, the folks who run a small convenience store uh, are, are seeing a, a big impact on their business and they're able to hire more people. Uh, truck drivers, welders, the people who aren't working directly for the gas industry but are, are, are contracting with them, they're the ones who are uh, seeing an increase in jobs uh, significantly. Uh, we traveled for, for some of our studies to other states who have 
experienced uh, th this sort of thing, uh, Arkansas, Texas, and, and we've seen you know, huge shopping centers popping up in these areas because they've had an influx of people, people are employed, uh, so there really are some positive economic and, and job benefits when, when it comes to uh, Marcella Shale, and Tom may be able to elaborate a little bit. On think, my answer. Yeah, I, th I think in the interest of time, I'm going to move on here because both of you have talked about that. Well, I think uh, Lisa touched on the transportation issue, so I'll concentrate on the agricultural issue because, uh, like she said, there's endless truck traffic, so that's just one way we're going our, going up roads and the like. But uh, in terms of agriculture, well, you can't farm without water, so ultimately that's our great concern that if groundwater is contaminated, if, if the water supply is just running short, how do you, how do you farm? Um, some insta instances that have already occurred that we were aware of, there's a paper that came out by a uh, veterinarian, uh, Dr. Michelle Bamberger, and her uh, biochemist husband, Dr. Robert Oswald, that looked at health impacts. And they looked at health impacts of gas drilling in humans and animals. And they found cases where uh, after an hours, of, an hours worth of exposure to fracking fluid, 19 cattle died. Um, there is another case last year in April. Uh, this uh, was in Bradford County on April 19th. There was a ma massive blowout. There were cattle that were grazing down from where the blowout occurred. So the, the stream that was in between where the blowout occurred and where they grazed was where they drank their water. They're, they were tested afterwards and they were found that their meat is just fine. However, they gave birth to 11 cattle that year, who, uh, eight of whom died at birth or shortly thereafter. So I don't necessarily want to eat that meat. So it depends on what kind of farming you're doing, but there have already been consequences. There are a number of organic farmers who are working desperately to try to get uh, organizations like the Pennsylvania uh, uh, Society for Sustainable Agriculture, I believe it is, uh, to come out with some statement opposing drilling or to at least call for a moratorium on drilling because uh, they're very, very concerned that their ability to grow food and especially to get the organic classification is threatened by this practice changes would we see in the area? Well, fortunately, Northampton County does not sit on the uh, shale, so you're definitely safe from that. Um, uh, but what you would see is, like I, I mentioned before, I have lots of friends who unfortunately live in these areas, and I see the drilling rigs, and they, they want to move because it's just nonstop truck traffic, air, air pollution, noise pollution, light pollution. And I think a great example is if you've ever traveled out west, where they started drilling much uh, further back than they have here. There are now ghost towns. There's an area in Wyoming where they took everything they could from it and then left. The water was completely destroyed. The air quality in Wyoming where you usually have clean air and clean water because you don't have a lot of residents, you don't have a lot of industry, the air pollution in this particular town in Wyoming is worse than downtown Los Angeles due to all the drilling that was going on. The town has recently become a ghost town. And if you look at the history of drilling, it creates more problems in the end than it ever solves. Gold mining, uranium mining, copper mining, silver mining, they all create water issues, environmental issues, and eventually ghost towns. And at one day, these gas companies will all leave, and they will leave behind their mess, just like the coal companies did, and we'll be stuck attempting to try to fix it. All right, so setback zones are basically areas that um, are set up to protect uh, critical habitats. And so one of the things that I do, I do uh, wetland delineations and rare plant surveys. And so very often, whenever you have a, a, a critical habitat like a wetland or an area where there are rare, are rare, rare plants or rare animals, what you want to do is you want to, first of all, circumscribe the, those particular areas to protect them from development. But then what you want to do is beyond that, you'd like to set some sort of a buffer zone, and whether that buffer zone might be 20 feet, 50 feet, 100 feet away, uh, to further protect um, the, the, uh, the areas that are, that are of value. And so in terms of, of uh, the impacts of, of hydrofracking on these, rare ha on, these, on these kinds of habitats, first of all, um, uh, uh, gas companies do have to abide by wetland regulations, which are both uh, state and federal regulations. And then they also do have to abide by uh, rare plant and rare animal regulations. So it's not like they can come in and just bulldoze everything. I think anybody who says that is basically lying to you. Um, the, the idea then is that how, how far away should we set um, uh, uh, gas wells away from areas like wetlands, areas like uh, critical habitat, or even areas like where there's open water for, or, or public water supply? 
And so um, there really is very little research done. And in fact, one of the points that I'll make toward the end of my, the, the, the presentation here is there really is little research and we need to fund a lot more research. But um, there, there was a couple studies, one study by Duke University where they looked at methane migration into drinking water and realized that methane in drinking water is not inherently toxic, although it can get your house to be blown up if there's, if there's too much methane. But basically what they found was that um, uh, water wells, uh, private water wells that were more than 1,500 meters away from a drilling rig, uh, they had low levels of methane consistently, whereas on the other hand, private wells that were um, uh, within 1,500 meters away, uh, many of them showed high levels of methane, but actually a lot of them didn't. So um, on one hand, you can, you can look at their study and say, well, you know, we, this is proof that hydrofracking uh, destroys drinking water supply. That's not at all true at all when you read their study. Um, and then the Penn State study, on the other hand, there was a study uh, where they looked at variety of compounds. They didn't, they didn't see any impact whatsoever, um, both before drilling and after drilling. So right now, we actually have very little research that's being done, or little, little, little scientific knowledge that's, no, that's known about how far setback zones should be. And that, again, should be something that all of you should be clamoring for, is we need more research to figure out what these setback zones could be. One of the, one of the possibilities is that, set, that there might not even be a need for any setback zone, or it might need to be a really big zone. Will American households see by switching from oil to natural gas and can you briefly discuss the short and long-term benefits of purchasing domestic natural gas versus foreign oil or gas? Okay, I'm so glad this question is on here because the biggest beneficiaries of natural gas development in the area that I come from are people in this area, and people in New Jersey, and people in New York City. Urban consumers are the biggest beneficiaries of this development. When I spoke to a, a similar group as this one at Brew College a few months ago, I pointed out to them when I started out that we were sitting in a building that was heated by steam, and that steam was generated by natural gas. So I told them, I said, the comfort you're enjoying today, as you listen to me, because it was in the winter, uh, is a result of natural gas development. Now don't tell us that we can't develop it for you to use. I want you to think about that, because a number of you raised your hands that you do use natural gas, and probably some of you don't think you do, do as well, because you're getting it from steam heat when you visit a building that's heated, that's generated by natural gas. The cost of natural gas, CNG, uh, and I think that's the best way to compare it uh, to gasoline, is about half. And CNG is coming. It is coming faster than I thought it would come. As a matter of fact, there are numerous stations in Bradford County now. There are numerous stations in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's got a fast track program to develop CNG fueling stations. We're seeing now the major auto dealers start to come out with CNG vehicles and vehicles that will alternate between gasoline and CNG. When that happens, you're going to see everybody uh, benefit by this. And the average savings to a house in New Jersey is about $500 per year based on what we're seeing right now from natural gas uh, development in the Marcellus region. That's the same as probably here. Um, so it, those are the consumers that are really benefiting. And we're seeing this with major companies, UGI, for example. Uh, we're seeing it throughout areas that are served by natural gas in the Marcellus region and in the metro region that are seeing tremendous cost savings. We, we were, for a while there, we were getting a report every week of, of all the savings that were occurring. So it is tremendous, and you're the people who should be for this, because you're the people who are getting the money in your pocket from it. Thank you. Carl? Well, gas companies are taxed, but what they're doing in Pennsylvania is, rather than registering their business as a corporation, where they would have to pay the 9.99% uh, net corporation taxes, they register themselves as limited partnerships or limited liability companies. And what they do then is that requires them to pay the lower tax rate, which is like the personal income tax rate of 3.07%. And there, there are some exemptions in the Pennsylvania tax code, such as the manufacturing exemption tax, and it also exempts these oil companies from local earned income taxes. And that was a ruling in 2002 by the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court. Uh, one, of the, one of the items that I found doing some research was from the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center, where in 2008, oil and the gas industry paid $38.8 million in taxes 
to the state of Pennsylvania. 17.8 corporate net income tax, 13 million in personal income taxes for their LLCs and LPs, and 8 million in their capital stock and franchise taxes, along with the personal income tax that people have to pay because of their royalties and their leasing agreements with the oil companies. So there are taxes being paid by the gas industry in Pennsylvania. So natural gas, and what would be the benefits? Well, when I speak and lecture, it's one thing I usually end with, but I'll, I'll you start with this today. If we harness everything that nature, that Mother Earth gives us naturally on a day-to-day -day basis, we wouldn't need all the other, we wouldn't need to ex extract and take from her as much as we do. If we harnessed every day somewhere in this world, the sun is shining, the wind is blowing, and the tides are flowing, and other countries have harnessed these powers and only these powers and are running fine, clean, and efficient. Pennsylvania has more, has the most wind east of the Mississippi than anybody else. If we work with wind power in our state, and we have, we have some, we do have some commercial wind turbines going, but we're capable right now of 4,000 megawatts of power from wind, and that's enough to power 1.2 million homes. And yes, that might not be enough, but if you bring that along with reducing our depend dependence on energy, it's something all of you can do. You don't need to have every TV on in the house. You need to unplug your chargers, get rid of your vampire electronics, so we'll reduce our loads, as other countries have. Um, but between wind and solar and other alternative energies, we can harness these to use safely, cleanly, and they will go on for, for the future. Native Americans had something called seventh generation, and you know there's a product, a green product out there called seventh generation, seventh generation. And what the Native Americans meant by that is everything they did, they charted out how is it going to affect seven generations down. We don't do that in extraction. If you look historically at all of our um, extraction processes, whether it's, it's gas, oil, coal, uh, uranium, silver, diamonds in, in Africa, they all come with an extreme cost, environmental cost. But if we harness what nature gives us naturally and use it in balance with nature, we can certainly power our needs. Other countries are doing it. I'm not, not sure why we're not. Uh, but I'll leave you with this quote of one of my favorite satirists, John Stewart. When the Gulf blew a, f a couple years ago, there was a prayer group going on, and they were praying for the oil to stop flowing. And he made a great comment. He said, I don't understand why they're all praying. God already did his job. He put all this stuff thousands and thousands of feet below the earth, and that's where it should stay. Of agriculture, George Greig commented on how farmers in Tioga County are struggling to make a living and said, now with Marcellus Shale, they've got money to burn. Can you explain the royalty payments to property owners? Tioga County residents formed what's called the Tioga County Landowners Group. It's about 1,800 families that own approximately 131,000 acres of land in that county. They have a website where they, they get legal information through lawyers, also uh, the EPA, the DEP, uh, the Geological Society, and they negotiate land leases from the oil companies, and within that land lease agreement, they have royalties. And if you would go on geology.com, there is a formula there for figuring out royalties. And these people have seen anywhere from $1,500 to $5,000 per acre of their lease agreement. And depending on the size of the well, they can earn anywhere from $2,000 to $3,000 a year upwards or a month up to $11,000 a month per well, per acre, depending on how their lease agreements are written up. And there are people right now in Tioga County who are pulling in thousands of dollars a month in royalties and land lease from the oil companies. Okay, uh, the Wilkes Energy Institute has community education as part of its mission. What are you doing to that end? What are the biggest challenges you're finding? And how can college students like us get involved? Okay, so I'm, I'm maybe glad to get sort of the last word here. So 
the, the Energy Institute that we have is now about two years old. Uh, we are ostensibly and, and explicitly unbiased. And so uh, we are neither pro-drilling nor are we anti-drilling. What we're really for is for the application of good science into public decision making and to have uh, all stakeholders really understand uh, the science that's out there. And so the um, first thing is that we actually have a web page that we put up. The web page, if you, I know you have a lot of web pages that you've seen or heard about. The one web page, if you go to one, is just simply energy.wilks.edu. Energy.wilks.edu. That's our, our, our website. We have a whole bunch of things that we have up there. Um, and so that, that's one of the things. The other thing that we're trying to do is we're, we're, we're looking at the science. We're trying to translate the science. Uh, for, um, you know, for, for various stakeholders. And so, for example, last summer, um, there was this Osborne article, the Duke study, that came out, and people who were for drilling thought that the Duke study was the worst study in the world. People who were against uh, uh, drilling thought the Duke study proved that hydrofracking is going to destroy our waters, and neither of those, um, those, those viewpoints were actually accurate. And so what we did was we actually put together a, um, a, a document that, that uh, was our interpretation of the Duke study and explained, first of all, what it was and then um, what we thought the, the strengths of that article were and then we thought what the drawbacks of the article were. So looking at it, and we, and we wrote this in a, in, in a very clear manner and we've had people tell us that this is a very clear understanding. The other thing that we've done is we're also trying to look at various issues. So one of the issues is whether indeed um, natural gas has a bigger greenhouse footprint than, um, uh, than, than coal does. And so there's a whole series of articles that have been written over the past year. Again, there was a study come out in Cornell that said that natural gas has, has a higher greenhouse footprint than coal. And then there have been seven other studies that came out since then that say just the opposite. So we, we put together another document, again, written in a very clear way that hopefully everybody can understand, um, that, that explains the science, that explains where we're at and uh, try to, to demystify uh, this, this uh, process. Then we also have little brochures we put together, what is Marcellus Shale, what is hydrofracking, uh, we're putting these together. And then I've also written an, uh, an article for environmental educators on how Marcellus Shale is actually a teachable moment and some of the lessons that environmental educators uh, can derive uh, from this. And so by the way, all of these things, I thought there'd be a table set up, but I do have uh, copies of these documents if, if any of you want to see them. Um, so as far as the biggest challenge goes, the biggest challenge is that first of all, every energy source has its drawback. Every single one. And I, I, I'm really bothered by people who pick up any energy source and basically beat it to death. We see it with wind, we see it with coal, we see it with nuclear, and now we're seeing it with natural gas. So, um, so one of the things you need to do is to think about, well, if not natural gas, then what? And I don't think the then what is, I don't think there's any clear answer. So one of the problems that we have is that people have very quickly made up their mind, either pro or, or anti, and so one of the, um, the, the, the challenges that we face is how do we educate people who are already, their minds are made up and they think it's the worst thing in the world, they think it's the best thing in the world, and how do we get people to really be talking together on this? And so that's, a, that's an enormous challenge. Um, as far as what college students can do, there's a lot you can do. One of them is just to be intelligent consumers of information and look for bias wherever the bias is, is presented, whether it's bias for or bias against, and both biases are equally nasty. And so, um, so you, you, you want to be careful in how you um, look at information. Uh, um, uh, uh, also, you want to, um, and, well, basically the other thing you can do is get involved in, in the science. And so we have at Wilkes, we have a, a big water quality effort going on. We have a lot of students who are involving, or we're involving in this. I know any of you who are, who are sophomores and looking to transfer to a school for your junior year, think of Wilkes. And if you're interested in energy, if you want to get involved in the real science and help discover the truth, we can put you to work uh, doing that. Um, the other thing is that there are lots of opportunities for citizens to get involved. Um, citizen science is a really big thing, so again, we're reaching out to various stakeholders um, to try to get uh, people involved in, 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 in doing this. The other thing you can do, as I said before, we have a really big problem, and the problem is that we have a lot of concerns that are expressed 
We don't really have that much science that's being done. The reason why we don't have that much science being done to address those concerns is because there's no money for it. All right, um, government doesn't want to pay for it. Uh, there's a problem with taking money from industry. Foundations don't really want to support it. And so we're, we're in a really bad position right now because we have all this arm waving that's going on, but really we don't really have the good science. So what you need to do is to contact your legislators and tell them to try to fund science for doing Marcellus Shale research and energy research in general um, fund it as much as you can, and when you hear Tea Party people saying, you know, government should be involved in anything, I need you to challenge those Tea Party people and say, we really do need to fund science, because in fact, having government fund science, because if you don't fund it, then it's, it's just simply going to be nonsense that you're going to have. And we have to do away with the nonsense, because we have very important decisions to make that our seventh generation um, will, will be able to have a sustainable future. So I need your help. Okay. On the fact of the, um, uh, the natural gas industry. And my second question. Uh, can, can, my can, can we keep it to one to give okay. other people an opportunity? Right. Thank you very much. Appreciate your flexibility. Yeah, Tom, can you, can you respond sure. to that? I, I don't know the answer to the amount of money, but I can tell you this. It goes on on both sides. Uh, and that's something that I, I get very annoyed about. I keep hearing these statistics about how much lobbying it is. And you mentioned common cause. Well, common cause gets money from the Park Foundation. The Park Foundation is a $315 million foundation that spends virtually all its money opposing gas drilling. And it has a distinct bias to try to keep gas drilling out of the Ithaca area where it's located. And so they run around and they fund the Common Cause, and the Common Cause gives the leadership of that association an award for being such a community-spirited party. Uh, it's a little bit incestuous, to be honest with you. And, and so I, I take great offense when I hear about all this lobbying, because it occurs on both sides. It occurs a great deal. I, I don't because I don't do that. That's not my area of you know what I do. So I can't answer that. I'm sure it's a considerable sum, and I'm not going to apologize for it. D does um, anybody on the panel have any figure? figures? Figures, because there's a website that provides all of it to you. But the Corbett administration's campaign, you know, for governor alone, took like over a million dollars from the natural gas industry. And if you want to see what all of your legislators did, go to MarcellusMoney.org. It's all there. There's also a great chart on pipeline, which is the Pittsburgh Post Gazette's uh, special section devoted to Marcellus Shale drilling, and they have an interactive chart of the people who contributed to Corbett's campaign, who then went on to serve on the Marcellus Shale Advisory Commission, a hand-picked group that he had write recommendations for how the industry should work. One of those contributors alone gave $411,000 to Corbett's campaign. Our current DEP chief's father and wife gave $306,500 to Corbett's campaign. I wonder how he got his job. <laughs> Is there another question?